thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to guide you a little bit through the ongoing revision, revision of guideline ICH Q5A. Um, the first part of my presentation uh, will deal with the general principle of the present ICH in order to understand the topics that are being revised. And in the second part, I will try to guide you a little bit through the slides that have been already provided on the ICH official website, uh, summarizing the contents of the revision. So let me just summarize the basic principles about viral safety. So, so unfortunately, there's no single measure that can guarantee viral safety of biological products. So, so the real safety comes by a combination of measures, such as selection of starting materials, the testing of raw materials, cell lines, and at the unprocessed bulk stage, and methods for viral inactivation removal. Unfortunately, none of these measures alone can guarantee viral safety. For example, um, with a biological product, it's of course not possible to avoid um, biological raw materials completely. And even a non-biological raw material has been found to, to be contaminated exogenously with viruses. And, and such material then can contaminate the production cell culture. Um, testing methods are also not, not um, ideal. So, so, so for viruses, we often have very specific test targeted to specific viruses, and, and some unexpected viruses might escape that our testing scheme. And finally, so, so, so it's always good to, to have uh, methods in place for viral inactivation removal that could uh, remove or inactivate uh, non-expected viruses. However, the, these, uh, there are some viruses that are quite resistant and, and even a high viral load might overwhelm, overrun a viral inactivation procedure. So, 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 so the principle of the ICH, and this was a very successful principle, was always the combination of these methods. Um, let me just review the, the selection of starting materials. Of course, uh, uh, much progress has come by replacing uh, biological raw materials. In, in biological product, it has become a common practice. It's not possible for every product, but for many products, to replace the bovine serum or even human serum by, by serum-free culture media. And also such, such enzymes as porcine trypsin that have been found to be contaminated can be nowadays replaced by bacteria enzymes, which are not usually not contaminated with animal or human viruses. And also other cell culture ingredients that I listed here um, can be replaced by, by safer sources. The current ICH uh, has a section, but only mentioned briefly, the, the, the strategy to, to replace uh, uh, such uh, cell culture ingredients, medium ingredients. However, this is one part of the revision where we took account in the chances to, to replace methods, replace ingredients, and also uh, knowing that that contamination cannot completely be in, in active, uh, avoided these materials cannot be completely uh, avoided. It is also now advised to, to apply some viral inactivation whenever possible. And it is, for example, possible to um, subject bovine serum towards gamma irradiation. The second um, measure for towards viral safety is the cell, uh, testing of cell culture. And the current ICH uh, outlines a very helpful scheme where to test cell culture. And of course, the most central point is the starting point. It's the master cell bank where extensive testing is required. A part of test is then also required for the working cell bank and also for the end of production cells. In the ICH, they are also sometimes referred to as LIFCA. LIFCA means cells at the limit of in vitro cell culture age. But it, we had a lot of discussion. It's, it's uh, more or less, it's really the same as end of production cells, EOP. And of course, um, even having safe or virus-free um, starting materials, virus-free cell banks, there might be always the, the risk for contamination during the fer fermentation procedure. So, so it's also advised to touch test each uh, unprocessed bulk uh, on a routine base for viruses, such as, uh, for example, MVM, because we had to, to experience uh, some cases of uh, fermenter contamination with this uh, mouse parvovirus. How 
testing on virus. Also here at the current ICH also outlines a list of tests that are of course quite helpful. And however, coming to the next slide, no, none of this test is perfect. So, so ele electron microscopy is a nice test. You see whether a virus is in, but it has a very poor detection limit. Uh, a, a very important uh, assay, and, and it's still intended to, to keep this assay, it's, it's the in vitro assay, so, so, so where fluid of the fermenter is, is inoculated onto indicator cell lines, and uh, these cell lines are sometimes very sensitive to detect uh, viruses replicating in cell culture. The drawback with this assay is, of course, uh, there are some viruses that would not in the, uh, replicate on this indicator cell culture. So also this in vitro assay detects a broad panel of viruses. It does not detect all viruses. Uh, another test which is uh, in place, but which is now under discussion, is the in vivo assay, where par uh, test material is inoculated either intraperitoneally or intravenously or intracranial into um, suckling mice or adult mice or hamsters, and, and then it is looked whether the hamster suffer from disease. The limitation with this assay is, again, it, it's very specific to certain uh, rodent viruses or murine viruses, and also the sensitivity level is uh, not uh, very good for many viruses. And also it's an in vivo assay, and we, tr we are trying to avoid the use of animals, and standardization of this assay has been always very poor. This is the same also for the antibody production test, such as the MAP or hamster anti-production test, which also targets only a specific set of mouse viruses and hamster viruses. There are also some helpful uh, infectivities for retroviruses, but again, the drawback is they are specific to few retrovirus species. Reverse transcriptase assay is, of course, very nice, but it's limited to retroviruses. And of course, uh, PCR tests have been always in discussion because they have, uh, are highly sensitive. But again, a PCR test assay is usually designed for specific viruses, so, so it would not uh, detect uh, non-expected viruses. And in the past uh, 10 years, we had expect cell culture contamination events, even by performing all these tests. Um, so, so it shows that the whole testing scheme was not, uh, was not um, successful. So, so for example, the porcine circovirus uh, contamination of the rotavirus vaccine, which had been already on the market and where millions of infants had been treated with this vaccine. Fortunately, this virus was not harmful towards human being. And also the insect cells that are frequently used uh, to produce recombinant proteins using Bacolo, uh, virus technology have been found to, to contain an unexpected or and up-to-date unknown viruses uh, and in new insect viruses that was found by new methodologies such as next generation sequencing. So, so introducing next generation sequencing is, is certainly the second main topic of revision of the guideline. And here I'm just outlining the workflow. The, uh, the method has been now in place since more than 10 years, but, but it's still highly under discussion. It's, it's a um, rapidly involving field. So, 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 so the principle shortly is to amplify and to sequence all DNA present in the samples. So, so the DNA from the host cell, the, the DNA from some en environmental germs, whatever. And then after having this huge amount of sequencing data, looking whether the sequencing data contains some known or some either uh, unknown virus. Of course, the, the unknown virus, it means it needs to be similar to, to some virus that is already in the database. And uh, it, it's um, nice that, that the public database are publicly uh, accessible and also there's an initiative for an FDA and a PDA interest group to, to provide a public accessible data on, on which is already updated every three months on, on viruses that have been identified. Of course, uh, an, uh, the, the test alone does not say whether uh, we have found an infectious virus or just an inactivated uh, viruses. Viruses also follow-up investigation are certainly needed to, to confirm positive results with this test. Um, so, so, so the next uh, also topic for, for, for revision will be the, the experience with methods for viral clearance. It has been wise to implement steps for viral clearance because we, we made the experience that 
these methods has been have been very successful to remove or inactivate non-expected contaminants. And uh, nowadays, um, companies are requested to perform product-specific viral validation studies, meaning validating in an in vitro downscale model the efficacy of this uh, viral clearance method. Uh, these clearance methods are sometimes quite uh, sensitive towards um, composition of the, in in of the intermediate. On the other hand, um, there are now uh, some methods in place that are quite robust, such as the solvent detergent treatment or treatment with Triton X100 alone, or low pH uh, treatment or removal of large viruses by filtration. And um, the revision of the guideline took acknowledge on this development it and it tried to define um, some, uh, some circumstances and some conditions where we can expect really quite robust uh, removal of, vi of, of viruses such as the solvent detergent treatment and, and the guideline also contains a new annex that outlines certain conditions where, where it, it it's, uh, can be really expected that viruses are reliably inactivated such as treating with 1% treat on X100 uh, and, and adding a certain kind of 3N-butylphosphate, TNBP, which is a solvent, uh, or having these two other mixtures, TREEN80 and TNBP, or natrium deoxycholate and TNBP. And even Triton alone, at a concentration of 0.5%, has been shown to be very robust in inactivating all kinds of um, enveloped viruses. Another set of experience has been ac accumulated with a low pH step that is usually applied after protein A uh, purification of monoclonal antibodies. Here it has been com common practice to, to incubate the eluate with the product for, for a certain time, one or two hours at uh, pH at low pH, which means uh, 3.8 or 3.7 or 3.6 for a certain temperature. And after reviewing um, results uh, for, for over 20 years, um, um, it could be concluded that, that adhering to a pH at least uh, 3.6 or lower for a certain time period, 30 minutes, and, and at a certain temperature, 15 degree, we can, and also using a, a specific buffer, acetate or citrate, other buffers show, show different effects, we can also expect um, uh, inactivation of this specific retrovirus. So, um, so, 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 so the revision of the guideline also try to ac account for this and, and opens now the possibility um, not to perform, pro uh, not needing to perform product specific studies provided that the company has accumulated a certain set of databases in house, which means uh, they really understand the process and have their own data that uh, confirm such concepts. The next topic for a big topic for revision is also the extension for the scope uh, towards viral vectors. And the traditional concept of viral vectors has also been uh, viral vectors, of course, need to introduce the genetic material into cells. And that means they consist of an infectious virus shell and applying viral inactivation might be difficult for, because it will destroy the infectivity of the product. On the other hand, um, we also learned that there are some methods, at least for some viruses, that can be applied that can kill a lot of viruses, not all. But uh, if the vector is made, has been derived, or if the vector has been derived from a virus that is very resistant towards viral inactivation, such as a parvovirus derived vectors, and I, I show, he show here the example with the adenovirus, adeno associated virus vector AAV. Um, so these are small viruses that are resistant. So small means that, that they can penetrate the usual viral filters. On the other hand, uh, larger viruses such as Bacolo helper virus or even this insect virus that I mentioned earlier could be removed from this vector preparation. Or also applying solvent detergent treatment will destroy all non-enveloped contaminants or non-enveloped helper virus while, while retaining the infectivity of the AAV vector. So, so, so this was the basis in saying, okay, at least some of the viral vectors can be subjected to these three methods towards viral safety. And uh, in this um, context, it made sense to include 
um, such viruses in the ICHQ5A. So I'm now um, coming through the set for I'm coming to the set of slides provided by ICH on the revision. The, you can find these slides also on the website of ICH on the official website, and this is just the, the public disclaimer. Um, so so we, we can use uh, this uh, presentation for our own, um, but of course ICH does not take any warranty and the above mentioned permission do not apply to content supplied by third parties. Um, as I noted before, so, so, so the ICH Q5A has been very successful. It, has, it was finalized in 1999. The guideline considers testing and evaluation of viral safety of biotechnology product derived from characterized cell lines or of human origin. On the other hand, um, looking for all this technology insight, technological, technological insights and developments is in the last 20 years, um, a concept paper and a business plan was developed and endorsed in Singapore on, at the ICH meeting in November 2019. The revision was signed off as a step two document this year, end of September 22 and is now open for public consultation. And anticipating finalization as a step four document, um, we would expect that we could finalize the document in November next year, but we are not really not sure. It really depends on how many comments we receive and how many discussion we will have ongoing. Um, as, as I mentioned before that, so, so there are, are four main topics for revision of the guideline. Um, the one topic I am, did not mention so far is uh, developments in manufacturing, and this means mainly the development towards continuous uh, production, continuous manufacturing. So, so this means that this is a long-term cell culture, and, and the cell culture fluid is continuously harvested, harvested continuously harvested, and then subjected uh, to, to a set of downstream purification procedure, which are all linked in line. And um, so, 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 so validation and testing of this uh, scheme is quite difficult and the guideline uh, added here also a new section. Then, as I mentioned before, uh, the guideline will add uh, uh, the viral vectors, so there will, will be an extension of the scope of products that are covered by this guideline. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, there have been developments in viral testing, such as the next generation sequencing. And finally, also, so we are taking account for, for um, facilitation of viral clearance validation whenever very robust uh, steps are implemented for viral clearance. This is just an overview on the section of the guideline. So the ba basic structure of the ICH Q5A guideline has been retained, um, so, but there have been major, sections, major changes in the introduction section. So uh, also acknowledging for the extension of the scope of the guideline. There have been major changes in the section on cell line qualification and the tests, uh, testing methods for viruses, also major changes in the methods for testing the unprocessed bulk, and uh, of course in the section for, for the viral clearance studies, and finally also uh, for, for the evaluation characterization of viral clearance procedures. And uh, as I said before, also there will be a completely new section on points to consider for continuous manufacturing process. The ICH guideline, as you know, contains a quite useful list of annexes and, and there have been two new annexes uh, also added. The one is an annex on applying examples of prior knowledge, including in-house experience to reduce product specific validation report. This, mean, this means this new annex describes three scenarios where prior knowledge can be applied towards viral clearance and where it might be not necessary to perform product specific clearance studies. 
And finally, there's also a complete new annex on the genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vector derived products. Uh, this annex also contains a list of tests that can be applied towards viral vectors. It also concludes a section on, on testing of the seed virus stocks as well as it gives some, some indication what kind of viral clearance method could be applied at least to, to non-enveloped viral vectors such as adenoviruses or adeno-associated viral vectors, AAVs. Um, for the new product types, yes, we had a lo lot of discussion yes, uh, whether to, to extend the scope and how to, sco to extend the scope. The scope is now defined as products that are amenable towards viral clearance without negative impact of, of on the product. Of course, this is not a very clear definition for a scope uh, grouping, uh, trying to, 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 to define what, what groups of pharmaceuticals are included or not. But it made sense in, in, in that respect that, that it really, uh, these products where you, we can apply viral clearance, it, it really makes sense to also to, to, to apply the whole concepts from the ICH U5A guideline. Um, it, it explained further that this includes genetically engineered viral vectors and viral vector derived products. This may also include viral vectors where a helper virus is not required to produce them. So, so we wanted to be clear that also AAVs that are produced from cells without a, uh, using a helper virus um, could be subjected to viral clearance. And of course, there can be also contamination events with such cell culture system. And it includes recombinant proteins that are expressed using helper viruses such as baculovirus, herpes simplex virus, or adenovirus vectors. It also includes viral vector derived products such as virus like particles, protein subunits, and nanoparticle based vaccines and therapeutics. Um, the, the sections, this, this slide just summarizes the sections where the, the extension of the scope has been implemented. In section two, the, the, the document now includes additional reference to the new products and, con and their context as, as described on the previous slide. There will also be a new case F to describe when a helper virus is used. I will come to this in the next slide. And it uh, describes the use of relevant model viruses for, for helper virus clearance. And as I mentioned before, also there is a new annex that includes specific considerations for this product types with respect to product testing and applying viral clearance. Just to, to explain a little bit the case F, what this means that the original guidelines contains five cases, case A, B, C, D, E. And case E means when, when the characterization results that no virus has been found, this is usually acceptable. Case B is also usually acceptable. These are the commonly used uh, rodent cell lines such as, as uh, SPO0 or CHO cells that usually are producing endogenous retrovirus particles. But it's, it's acceptable to use such cell culture for provided that the virus has been cleared. And it, the original guideline also says that it's, it's acceptable even if a non-pathogenic contaminant or even if a pathogenic contaminant has been found in the cell culture, it could be still acceptable on a case-by-case -case basis, of course, provided that the manufacturer can demonstrate reliable clearance of the virus from the final product. Of course, the case E would always be non-acceptable if we have an unknown virus, we really try to, must understand the, the pathogenic danger of this uh, virus before we could accept such a case. As I mentioned, a new case F will be added to this list of cases. This is the case when uh, companies have to use a helper virus. This will also be generally acceptable, but the guideline will recommend to, to demonstrate clearance of this virus because it's, it's a uh, non-wanted part of the, of the final product. I will now come to the uh, continuous manufacturing. Continuous ma manufacturing is an amazing technology and really it really op uh, offers uh, benefits such as really high throughput and, 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 and economical production. On, on the other hand, um, th there are some specific uh, aspects that need to, to be considered with respect to viral safety. 
So it was decided to create a new section in the ICH 205A guideline on points to consider for continuous manufacturing. This section is really limited to virus safety considerations that are specific to continuous manufacturing. And it was this has been designed to be read in parallel with ICHQ 13. This is another ICH guideline which has been already out for public consultation and the phase has been finished on continuous manufacturing. And the section describes when batch process evaluation for viral clearance could, could be considered sufficient as a scale down model. As I mentioned, the, the, the new section has been designed to highlight aspects that are specific for continuous manufacturing, such as the longer cell cold cultivation period. Another problem is that uh, the diversion and segregation impact is very difficult because the product is continuously harvested. So, so there's no clear batch to batch manufacturing. And also uh, we need to consider sampling consideration of cell culture uh, for the cell culture. So the there's no clear end of production cell culture because it's, it's always an end of production stage. So, 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 so this would mean that, that there should be a continuous, man, uh, continuous, continuous surveillance of the manufacture by virus testing. And uh, the section also contains um, some hints on chromatic steps, on low pH and solvent detergent treatment, and on viral filtration. So these uh, steps are considered units that could be still evaluated or validated in a traditional downscale model. Uh, of course, provided that, that all the specificities from the continuous manufacturing are taken into account. I just want to uh, mention that continuous manufacturing does not mean um, homogeneous manufacturing and, and the, uh, the issue with the continuous manufacturing is that the in product intermediates might be quite inhomogeneous. So, so, so whenever validating and viral clearance steps, it, the clearance studies would have tried to bracket all these inhomogeneities that can be found during the production. Next uh, big change is the update on the new test methods. And as I mentioned, um, there is of course this, this general uh, aim and desire to, to replace um, in vivo test. And we have, to have made it this amazing experience with next generation sequencing. So, so um, I can confirm this also from my personal experience. NGS has been very successful in detecting uh, cell culture contaminations. And um, the, the good thing with cell culture or the, the easy thing with cell, cell culture contamination is uh, once a virus replicates in a cell culture, it's usually found in a, in a quite substantial amount, medium titer or high titer. So, 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 so the problem with testing sensitivity is not that severe as it is for clinical diagnostics. And NGS has been really um, successful in, in detecting viruses that escaped all the traditional virus tests. So, so, so the new guideline really uh, recommends um, and, and encourages the implementation of the, this new technology and next generation sequences. Um, there is only a limited description on method qualification or method validation. We had a long discussion in the drafting group, however, we have so many virus tests and it's really not, not the aim of, of this guideline to provide a, a guideline on how to validate tests. So, so, so there is uh, some, some limited information, but, but it's certainly not sufficient. But I, I also should mention that there will be another European Pharmacopoeia chapter in elo elaboration, which is being drafted also with uh, participating experts from, from, from industry and from US FDA in order to get a harmonized uh, further technical document on method validation. Um, and also um, certainly um, NGS is, is an in vitro method with, which does not need uh, animal assay. And, and, and uh, certainly it, it, it's always uh, fine to reduce animal assay. And, and really knowing about the limitation that I explained before of the traditional in vivo assay and the anti-production test, really the, the guideline uh, offers now the opportunity to replace uh, this test. And, and 
it even says also that no direct head-to-head uh, -head validation is, is needed when replacing a test. So, so, so even um, products with an existing marketing authorization, manufacturers could file a variation saying, okay, I want to leave out the in vivo test and, and I want to replace it by, by next generation sequencing. Um, another, this is rather a minor change, but it's, it's of course important for, for, for pharmaceutical industry, is, is the, the uh, validation of resin reuse. Um, um, as you probably know, when, whenever doing vial clearance studies for marketing authorization, it, it's, it's usual now not to only to perform the, the vital clearance capacity of new chromatographic racing, but also of the used chromatographic racing. On the other hand, that there has been also specifically with monoclonal antibody um, purification, there's now long experience and we do have a good scientific understanding of the protein A affinity capture chromatography. And and there's now really good, good um, mechanistical explanation also and experience that, that uh, the old protein A racing, yes, it, it might fail to, to, to purify the antibody, but usually the, the viral removal the capacity does not uh, get worse with the used racing. This can be readily explained because we are now understanding usually that there is some non-specific binding of uh, interaction of virus with monoclonal antibodies, both are then bound to the protein A and co-eluded. So, so, so whenever the protein A fails to bind the antibody, it will also fail to co-purify the virus. And uh, that's a good explanation why, why it's usually not anymore necessary to perform studies with end of use racing for protein A chromatography. For protein A, that's quite clear. We did had much more discussion on, on other chromatographic resins such as anion exchange resins and cation exchange resins. Also here, industry has accumulated some, some quite um, long-standing database that usually these this, um, resins are quite robust towards viral removal, so, so they usually don't lose their viral retaining capacity and, and the guideline takes acknowledge for this and opens at least the possibility if a company has a good database with their used racing also to justify that they would not need to perform studies on used chromatographic racing. And let me come now also this uh, also makes the switch to, to applying prior knowledge towards viral clearance or viral reduction studies. As I mentioned earlier, as we now have over 20 years experience at least with monoclonal antibody purification and um, we have a good understanding of clearance mechanism and, and um, we, we at least know that some methods are quite robust in viral clearance. So, so this is specifically thing, uh, steps to such as viral filtration or applying solvent detergent, detergent treatment, or the, the, the example that I mentioned with the uh, XMULF, the retrovirus and the low pH uh, incubation. So, so therefore a new Annex 6 and a new Section F have been created in the revised guideline outlining the principle when uh, prior knowledge or experience with viral clearance method could justify not doing a product-specific uh, viral validation study. Of course, we have to be careful with this because there are also some examples that some methods are not that robust. So the uh, revised guideline really tries, tries to give some guideline with saying what methods are amenable to, to this concept and, and where it could be applied. And so, so, so the, let me refer to this new Annex 6 that has been created. And this Annex 6 gives three examples of using prior knowledge, including the noun criticality were already established um, for some parameters. So, so this means for, for solvent detergent, as I showed on my previous slides and low pH incubation, we really have an understanding of process parameters where we can expect robust uh, viral clearance. And if a company now has uh, accumulated a set of database, uh, so this means in-house experience on their own, where they have a real good understanding what they did, what kind of product they used, they could, could um, apply the reduction 
factors from this set of ex, uh, ex, uh, experiments towards a new product. There's also a section on viral filtration. We had a lot uh, of discussion on viral filtration. And um, viral filtration is really quite robust with respect to removal of large viruses. And we are happy that, for example, for monoclonal antibodies, people now commonly use, companies commonly use a, a small parvovirus filter. This, this means a filter that can even remove the small parvoviruses. And so, so, so having demonstrated with such filters, uh, parvovirus reduction in the order of uh, five or six log, which is quite usually, we find that it's now not necessary anymore to do the same type of reduction studies with the much larger viruses, such as a retrovirus or, or as a herpes virus or a reovirus. So, so here it would be really sufficient to use only the, the, the parvovirus as a small worst case model viruses, thus omitting studies, the, the, the clearance studies with the larger viruses. Um, on the other hand, we, we also decided, uh, the draft also says that a confirmatory run is still expected for viral filtration and parvovirus. So sorry, this, this is missing on my slides. So, so parvovirus evaluation only for nanofiltration. This comes from the experience that also these filters are quite robust. With they have been designed for parvovirus clearance. So also these filters are quite robust with parvovirus clearance. Um, there are still there's still some cases where, where we observed breakthrough of parvovirus. So 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 the recommendation at the moment is to do a protein confirmatory run with parvovirus, and I would even add that, that such confirmatory run should also consider worst case conditions such as high, volumet high volumetric load or low pressure, which are usually worst ca case condition for the parvovirus filtration. The, the last uh, set of changes I, I would like to mention is also the risk assessment. In the old guideline, you will find an example where the, the input is quantified, so, so how much virus particles are found in the unprocessed bulk, and this is uh, then uh, balanced with the viral clearance capacity, and it was usual uh, expectation to, to demonstrate a minus six log uh, excess viral clearance. However, discussing the issues and acknowledging also that these particles are usually non-infectious, the new guideline says that for at least for the CHO-derived retrovirus particles, a demonstration of a four-log safety margin would be sufficient. So for the CHO cell-derived products, um, also this is also some, some interesting change for, for CHO cell-derived products. CHO-derived endogenous virus particles can also be used for clearance experiments. Endogenous uh, particles may, may be that companies might obtain a cell culture fluid containing a high amount of non-infectious endogenous particles, and companies may now be uh, loose to do their virus clearance studies with this preparation. This, this might be a good opportunity for, for companies because these are non-infectious particles, and it's not necessary to, to go to a contract labort, uh, laboratory to, to need to book a contract laboratory to do these studies. So, so, so this spike also could be used by the companies themselves to do in their own labs uh, viral clearance studies. Of course, it does not work for the inactivation method, but it at least works for, for removal methods such as viral filtration or chromatographic steps. So, so let me now uh, summarize where we are with the guideline. So as I mentioned, the guideline, the draft guideline has been published end of September and there's usually a four months consultation period. I, I don't know the exact date uh, in Korea, but, but it should be somewhere end of January, beginning of February, where comments are expected. And we are of course uh, happy to re receive helpful um, list of comments from, from you. And depending, of course, on the number of comments and, and on the severity of discussion that these comments provoke, um, we hope that we uh, can finalize the, the document by November 23 uh, in the next year. And I would like to thank you for the attention.